Okay, welcome to Intro to C Programming. Today's lecture is on function prototypes. To start off, here's a review of functions. Functions just allow a certain piece of code to execute only when the function is called. To create the function, like I have here on line one, we include the return type, the name of the function, and then an optional parameter list. The parameter list could consist of no variables, one variable, or a comma-separated list of more than one. We have the type of the variable followed by a name. That variable is only able to be accessed inside of that function. It's not able to be accessed anywhere else. When we call the function, we type the name of the function followed by what variables we would like to pass in for those. So you can see here on line 8, I'm calling the function myfunc. The first parameter I'm passing in is the character j. The second parameter is the number 3.3. .3. When this function gets called, this variable c on line 1 as the, the first parameter to that function will get the character j. The second variable d will get the value 3.3. .3. On line 9, you see that I call this function. I pass in the variable named ch. ch actually contains uh, the character j, but it's actually going to copy character j from this variable ch and put it into this variable c. The value dub which has the value 3.3, .3. this variable dub, the value will be copied into this variable d. These variables, ch related to c and dub related to d, have absolutely nothing to do with each other outside of the fact that they will contain the same value at the time that the function is called. If I change the value of that variable inside of this function, it will not change the value of the variable uh, from the main function. So inside here on line 2, if I had said c equals 4.4, when I come back down to my main function, I print out the value of ch, it will still be 3.3. .3. It does not change the value of the variable in the function that called it. We're going to talk more about this in a future lecture, but this is called passing a variable by value. And we'll talk about different ways that we pass variables in the future. Uh, we have a return value, so you see here on line 1 that this function is going to return an int value to us. That means that, that inside of this function, along all paths of execution, we have to have a return statement that returns an integer back to us. It could be a variable or it could be a hard-coded value, but we have to have a return statement along all paths of execution through this function. That value that gets returned is going to go back into the variable, which is set equal to the function. So in this case, on line 8, you can see that we're setting it equal to a variable called val. So whatever value is returned from this function, my func, is going to go into this variable val on this function call. The next time that I call the function here, you see that I'm setting it into a variable called val2. The restriction that I have on both of these variables is that they must have the same type as the return type of the function. So on line 1, you see the return type is an int, and you see that val and val2 both are of type int, as declared here on line 5. Okay, so on to how we order the functions in our code. Uh, the program that I wrote for you in the last lecture and uh, the programs that you've been writing, hopefully you've had your functions defined, your personal functions defined above the main function. The last function inside of your file typically is your main function. This is not only by convention, but actually so far it's been out of necessity, even though you may not have realized it. By convention, we will put the main function at the bottom of all of our files, and we will have any other user-defined functions are going to be up above that. So as you are writing additional functions, you would put those above the main function. The reason for that is because we have to make sure that the function has been defined before we call it. And if we haven't defined the function above where we call it, the compiler will complain to us and say that that function doesn't exist. It's not yet been defined. So we have always put our function definitions and implementations above the main function and then called those functions from the main function. So by the time the compiler got down to the main function, where the function was being called, that function had already been defined above it. Now, this can cause a problem for programmers because we don't want to always have to be concerned with the placement of functions determining the order in which they have to be called. Sometimes we're going to want to be able to call functions that aren't necessarily in the exact hierarchical order. So we have um, some code that we can use for that. There's also another reason why this can't always be the case. 
So take a look at this code that I have on this slide. You see that I have the main function declared on line one. On line two, I'm calling the function add, which is declared on line four. This code will not compile because when the compiler gets down to line two, it will say that we're trying to call a function that has not yet been defined. To fix this, we just need to take the main function, so lines one through three, and put that down underneath our add function. So put that down on line 10, and then our code will compile because the compiler will go through the code, find the definition for the add function, and then get down to the main function where we call it, uh, and that function will have already been defined. Now here is an example. I don't have a main function in this code, but here's an example of some uh, problem that we have with having to order our functions. What you notice here is that these two functions uh, call each other. Okay, so you see here uh, on this slide that on line 11, we're calling the add function from the add one function, but then on line three, we're calling the add one function from the add function. This is actually known as indirect recursion. We're gonna talk about recursion uh, in our next lecture. However, what you can see looking at the question I have at the bottom of this slide is that it's not possible for us to put the function definition above the function call because we can't put both functions above the other function since they each call uh, the other. So in this case, we're gonna have to use uh, this new technique that I'm gonna show you today, which is called function prototypes. So this allows us to uh, provide a solution for that problem where we have uh, indirect recursion, and it also allows the programmer to not have to worry about the order of the functions, that you can order the functions however you'd like regardless of how the functions are called. A function prototype consists uh, merely of the function definition or the declaration without the implementation. Uh, so that would be the return type, the name of the function, the parenthesis, the parameter list, a closed parenthesis followed by a semicolon. You just do not provide the implementation of the function. So we're just gonna provide the uh, definition of the function uh, followed by a semicolon. We put that up at the top of our code. So you see on this slide, lines two and three, we have uh, the function prototypes up at the top. Now, once we put the function prototypes there, and they're going to appear immediately after all of our preprocessor directives, which are the lines that start with the pound sign. Then we put our function prototypes. Now, we are able to order the functions in our code for which we have prototypes in whatever order we would like. Uh, so now we can have both the add and the add one functions which call each other and we can put them in any order because the compiler is going to come through the code. It gets down to line two and it's going to uh, say, okay, well now I know that there, this is the definition of the add one function. It takes an integer as a parameter and it returns an integer back to me. Here's the definition of the add function. It takes an integer as a parameter and it returns an integer back to me. Then it comes to line four and says, oh, here's the implementation of that add function that takes an integer and returns an integer. When it gets down here to line six and it says return add one, passing in an integer here, it says, oh, you know what? I know that there is a function that returns an integer and takes an integer and is named add one because on line two, the programmer gave me a promise. Uh, he promised me that there is going to be a function implementation where there's a function called add one that takes an int and returns an int. I haven't quite found the implementation yet. However, I know that the programmer has given me a guarantee and promised me that there will be one somewhere. As the compiler continues going through the code, it then finds it on line 10. So uh, one thing that you'll notice here on lines two and three in the function prototypes, optionally, we are able to leave off the name of the variable inside the parameter list. The compiler doesn't necessarily care what you name that variable. What's important at this point is that it knows that the function returns an int and it takes an int as a parameter. If we had more than one parameter, you would just have after int, you have a comma and then maybe char. And that would mean that the first parameter is an integer and the second parameter is a character. You don't have to put the name of the variable in the function prototype. If you want to, you can, and it still will compile. However, optionally, you do not have to. So typically, programmers, since as I've told you in previous lectures, they are inherently lazy, they will leave off uh, the name of the variable in the parameter list of the function prototype. Okay, that's it for function prototypes. We'll write a program where we utilize them in just a second. So I will talk with you all then.